Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth Kuwait Dental Administration Conference. Uh, it is my pleasure to present our first guest, guest lecture of the conference, a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Samhan Ajmi. Dr. Samhan obtained his uh, dental degree in 2008 from the University of Dundee in Scotland. He did his postgraduate training at the University of Pennsylvania, receiving a certificate in endodontics and a um, master's in oral biology in 2014. Dr. Samhan did a one-year implant fellowship at Tufts University in 2014. He is a diplomate of the American Board of Endodontics, and this morning his lecture is titled Management of Failed Root Canal Treatments. Please welcome with me Dr. Samhan Ajmi. Thank you so much, and good morning, everybody. Um, the reason that I chose this topic, the management of failed root canal treatments, is because a big part of the daily uh, consult request that I get um, on a daily basis is all about failed root canal treatments. And because I am an endodontist and I also place a lot of implants, you, you can see the background that I'm coming from. Um, so I'm going to compare the um, um, options of retreatments versus uh, apical surgery versus implants. So at the beginning, I'm going to start with the uh, how do we assess failed root canal treatments. And then I'm going to start to compare each treatment option. And by the end of the presentation, I'm going to wrap everything up with the conclusion. But before I do that, I'd like to spend some time on speaking on the success rate of initial root canal treatments. And these are data that came from probably three to four decades. Um, there is no question about it. The success rate of the primary root canal treatments is in the 91-94%, whereas the root canal treatments survival rate is 97%. Now, you all understand the difference between success and survival. Success is based on a specific criteria, strict criteria, whereas the survival is actually, even if the tooth has a lesion, but as long as it's functional, then it is considered to be survival. Now, despite the fact that we do everything we do, and, and with all the advancement in endodontics, there is always going to be cases that fails. And that is the uh, case with any dental procedure, any medical procedure, or any profession in the world. There's nothing that works 100% of the time, and that is a fact. <clears throat> now, we usually, when we see cases, we categorize them based on a success and failure. And that created some problem, because if something that did not succeed 100% of the time, uh, the lesion did not completely heal, we consider the case as a failure. And we already know that the healing process of a lesion takes up to four years. That is a fact. And take this case as an example, a case that I treated. And as you can see, there is a lesion associated with the mesiobuccal root. And after two years, the lesion did not completely heal. So if someone else take a picture of that tooth at another place, they might think that this is a failed root canal treatment, whereas it's in the healing process. <clears throat> and that's why Friedman came up with different um, terms. Instead of success and failure, uh, he used healed for succeeded cases. Healing is the cases that is in the process of healing, and disease for cases that um, either did not change or got worse. So why do root canal treatments fail? There are a lot of technical things. Um, 
it could be an inadequate previous root canal treatment, such as this case. It could be a coronal leakage, and we know that uh, gutta percha do not bond to the dentine, so any coronal leakage is going to lead for um, um, a failure because bacteria is going to swim all the way down to the periavicular lesion. Uh, transportation, where you create your own canals, and obviously that is going to fail. Complex anatomy, where you can't really clean uh, the canal properly. Missed canals, for obvious reasons. Or separated instruments. Now, separated instruments, if not cleaned before the separation happens, it's going to fail and overfillings of gutta percha because gutta percha is not a biocompatible material. Now, some of the problems that leads to failures can be managed by retreatments, and some of them cannot. The diagnostic tools right now uh, that we use to assess a, a failed case is percussion and palpation. And if a patient is sensitive to percussion and palpation, that indicates that there is an active disease. There is either an abscess or a granulation tissue. And also, we do probing to rule out any periodontal problem. And also, we take radiographs to detect lesions. Now, when you see a lesion associated with a radiograph, that basically means there is a bone loss. And we all studied that there are tons of different type of odontogenic and non-odontogenic lesions that can lead to um, um, a lesion. But we always assume that when there is a failed case, it's apical periodontitis. And we are right in the most of the time, but we have to be open to other possibilities. And that's why it's important to follow up with the patients to see if they respond well to the case or not. CBCT has proved itself to be a very helpful diagnostic tool. Um, it can look at the lesion in three-dimensional uh, and look at the anatomy as well. And it is really a good tool. But we still have problems with beam hardening. And beam hardening is basically when there is a radio-opaque material, such as gutta percha or a filling, there will be some kind of scatter. And that scatter uh, creates false positive results, meaning that you might think that there is a fracture, but it's not a fracture, it's just a scatter. The same with missed canals. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, with failed root canal treatments, there will be gutta percha, so we have to be careful when we use CBCT. Now, let's assume that you had a patient, you did your clinical examination, and you found that he has a problem with a previous root canal treatment, such as this case. What are the options that are available? The first option would be a retreatment. The second option is abicoectomy. And the third option is extraction and implant. And I'm going to start with retreatments. Retreatment is probably the most popular way of dealing with previous root canal treatments. And what made it easier to do is the flexibility of gutta percha. It's easy to be removed which is going to allow us to remove the gutta percha and clean the canal again. The indications for retreatments is symptomatic apical periodontitis, inadequate previous root canal treatment, or defective root canal coronal restoration for obvious reasons. Uh, the contraindications would be transportation, Retreatment is really difficult on these cases. Separated instrument, where you don't think you're going to remove the separated instrument. And large 
posts. And here you have to think of risk benefit. Are you going to safely remove the post without destroying the tooth structure? And that can be tricky and it comes with experience. When you suspect vertical fracture, where you think exploratory surgery might be uh, done first before you do the retreatment. Now, retreatments are usually done over two visits. In the first visit, we clean and shave and place calcium hydroxide. And then after a week, we obturate the canal. And if you haven't done your axis conservatively, you might have to uh, redo the crown, which is going to take another two visits. So the average of appointments of retreatment is from two to four. And the cost in Kuwait is in around 450 KD on average. So how successful are retreatments? One of the most popular papers is the Toronto study. And they found that the success rate of retreatments where there is no periapical lesion is around 92%. But if there is a periapical lesion, that drops 5 to 10 percent to 80 to 85 percent. Another very popular study is Gorni and Gagliani. After two years, they found that when the anatomy is respected, the success is around 87 percent, whereas when the anatomy is altered or was not respected, that drops to 47%. And that makes a lot of sense because success is all about cleaning. Now, this is a case that I found that there is a, a mesiobuccal um, uh, lesion with the mesiobuccal root uh, and we confirmed that there is a missing canal based on the CBCT I did the um, retreatments and I found the MB2. So that healed after two years, not completely healed, but in the process of healing. And you can see the difference between the right and left uh, radiographs. But not all, I mean, not every case is a heavy case. Sometimes we can't get to the length and sometimes we, get, we block ourselves and sometimes the lesions do not heal. So we have to think of other options. And the second option is abicoectomy. And abicoectomy is basically a surgical procedure to remove the tip of the root and we seal it with a biocompatible material such as MTA or bioceramic. It has different names. Surgical retreatment is a very popular name Abisectomy, abical surgery, abico, which is a shortcut of abicoectomy, and periradicular surgery. And periradicular surgery is probably the most scientific name. Now, there is a huge difference between the traditional root end surgery and the endodontic microsurgery. And one of the most popular papers that compared the two procedures is by Frank Setzer. And what he showed in a meta-analysis that the success rate of traditional routine surgery is 59% compared to 94% for the endodontic microsurgery. And the traditional routine surgery is basically, or used to be done extensively by surgeons, uh, and they make a huge osteotomy, an opening on the bone, where they cut the root tip and then they make a groove with a round bear and place amalgam. And I'm sure that you've seen a lot of these cases. On the other hand, endodontic microsurgery is done under the microscope and conservatively uh, remove the bone around the apex and remove the apex, clean the canal, and place a biocompatible material which basically appreciate the root canal there. 
The indication for the apicoectomy is adequate previous root canal treatment, where you think that you can do a better job, such as your own cases. Overfilling, where you don't think that retreatment is an option to remove the gutta percha. Separated instrument, when you think that you're going to need the biopsy, or if you have a complex anatomy or transportation. Basically, cases that you can do retreatments on. On the other hand, the contraindications is poor previous root canals. And these you would have to do the retreatment first. Patients who are medically compromised that are not fit for any surgery, if the roots are in close proximity of the sinus or the uh, inferior alveolar nerve, or if you have an uncooperative patient, they can make the surgery very difficult or difficult accessibility. Now, we do abicoectomy on every single tooth in the mouth except second and third molars. We can do up to the first molar for accessibility. Now, to do an abicoectomy, you have to be really trained on this. You have to be comfortable with the microscope. You have to get a specifically designed instrument that is designed for apical surgeries with micro instruments. You're going to need a ultrasonic tips that is angled to prepare the root end. You also need a angled um, handpiece, a CBCT, and then you're going to need methylene blue and bracelets. Methylene blue is just a stain that we use during the surgery to detect any missing canals or any fractures. And apirestlets is uh, cotton uh, with a epinephrine to control bleeding. What I love about CBCT is that it, it made our day easy. Uh, it can accurately uh, locate the osteotomy sites and made the surgical uh, very conservative. And I'm going to show you cases in a minute. So how do we do it? After we locate our osteotomy site, we only remove three millimeter of bone around the apex. And then, now, these might look big, but the picture was taken by a microscope, but it's really small. And think about three millimeter. We also resect three millimeter from the apex, and the reason is because 95% of the apical ramification is within the last three millimeter. And we also use ultrasonics to remove the gut aperture from the last three millimeter to facilitate the root end filling. Once that is done, we use the MTA or bioceramic. Now, MTA is difficult to mix. And if you used it before, you know what I mean. But basically, we use a microplastic instrument. Uh, we mix it and place it on a bite, uh, MTA block, and then we take in. This is how it looks. And you can really appreciate how small the MTA can be. And this is a microscopic photograph uh, of bioceramic that is about to be placed into the root end. And we also condense it with micro pluggers. The reason we use MTA and bioceramic because these are biocompatible materials. What they do is that they stimulate heart tissues such as cementum and osteoblasts. And that what made the success really high compared to amalgam. And we all know amalgam doesn't bond to the tooth at all. What I love about a bicoectomy is that it's done in one visit. We don't have to do a root canal treatments. We don't have to touch the crown. And what's good about it is that you deal with the root problem. You actually 
aim for the infection, remove the infection, and deal with the root problem. And it almost provides an immediate healing after the soft tissue healing. And I'm going to show you how it works. This is a case that I saw a couple of years ago. And if you can see, the, the problem with the laser doesn't work on the screen. It's not the projector. So in the mesiobuccal root of the lower molar, there is a separated instrument. And because the patient had a nice crown with post, we decided to do the uh, abicoectomy for the molar and also for the premolar. I did the calculations, and then I started the procedure. Now, that, this is a five minutes video to show you how the abicoectomy is done. So I speeded up the uh, video speed. I'm not that fast. But um, just to let you be able to see it quickly. So usually the vertical release is, is extended one tooth forward and one tooth backward. But with lower molars, we extend it even further, uh, uh, two, two teeth forward and one tooth backward. And the reason is because of the mental nerve. We wanted to avoid touching the mental nerve by going mesial to the first um, premolar. And this is me doing the calculations. And as you can see, there is no buccal perforation, so I had to make my own um, osteotomy. So, um, so I just separated the root tip, and now with a spoon, I'm trying to uh, remove the root tip. Probably the most difficult part of the apical surgery is removing um, granulation tissue. It takes some time, and probably it might take 10 minutes, but you have to be patient with removing granulation tissues. Using the back of the spoon is a key, because if you use the spoon um, forward, it's going to cut the lesion into small pieces. So I use the back of the spoon to separate it from the bone, so I can remove it in one piece. So I finished from the premolar, and they started to do the mesial root of the molar. So with CBCT, because it's really accurate, you can make two osteotomy to the molar. And leaving a bridge in between actually promote healing and make healing really fast compared to a big one osteotomy. So now I'm standing with methylene blue to detect if there is any extra uh, canals or any fractures, this is the ultrasonic used to remove the gutta percha. Now we're going to see the mesial uh, root has a isthmus communication between the 
uh, buccal and lingual canals. And this all has to be prepped in one prep. Some of the sealer. So this is the bioceramic putty is placed. And this is the micro plugger. So by the end of the process, what's good about it is that in the majority of the cases, we don't need any bone grafts or uh, membranes. Because it's conservative, we expect it to heal really quick. And because it's surrounded by bone, we expect the bone to fill it uh, evenly. Now, this is the post-op radiograph. And I saw the patient a year later, and there is a complete bone healing around the roots. And you can trace the PDL around each root of these. So comparing the post-op with the one-year follow-up, you can see the difference. This is another case that presented to me three years ago. And as you can see, there is a separated instrument with the mesiobuccal root of the molar. So we decided to do the surgery. As you can see, this is the granulation tissue. Already made the osteotomy for us, so we don't have to really drill the bone. I removed the um, granulation tissue. And this is the mesiobuccal root after the resection. You see the communication between the MB1 and MB2. And this is the radiograph before I sutured. As you can see, the granulation tissue has been completely removed. And it was filled with bioceramic putty. And then I sutured. Now, this is the post-op radiograph. The patient came after two years, and you can see there is a complete bone healing. And I also, for curiosity, I took a CBCT and look at the complete bone fill around the root. <clears throat> now, I just came back to Kuwait last summer, so I started to do these procedures. And this is one of the procedures that I did probably five months ago. The patient came with a failed retreatments. He actually had a failure in the first treatments, and then he had another failure after the retreatment. And he has been having a pain for most, more than a one year, but he always take antibiotics. He doesn't want to extract the tooth. And when he came to me, it was actually referred by one uh, of my colleagues he had a nice filling. I don't think that I can do a better job than this. And he had a nice crown as well. So I told him, I explained the procedure. He didn't understand it at the beginning. He was um, scared, to be honest. But I reassured him. And we did the procedure. And a week later, uh, for s he found me on LinkedIn um, app. And he added me. And he said, listen, doctor. It completely healed. I don't feel the pain anymore. And this is the kind of response that you usually get when you get a nice results with Abicos. It provides immediate healing. Once the soft tissue heals, people will start to see the difference. So I texted him back on LinkedIn, and they told him, can you come to the office so we can take a radiograph? And he came, and this is the post-op. After four months, the bone completely healed. And this is how uh, it was compared to the post-op radiograph. Another case, um, this is actually a dentist who presented to our office for immediate implant placement. And this is what he requested. And when I saw the uh, radiograph, I told him, listen, we can do the abico if you wanted to save your tooth. 
but he never seen it. He, he just heard about it. So I showed him some videos and he was convinced. So we did the procedure and then I talked to him after one week and he said, listen, the, the, the pain is gone. So I took another radiograph a four months later and you can trace the PDL around the mesial root, not sure about the distal root. But the, there is a complete bone fill. Now, how successful is these treatments? The literature, one of the most popular paper in this field is by Rubenstein and Kim. And what they showed after one year, the success is around 96.8. But after five to seven years, the success is um, around 91%. And what they used is super EBA. It's not a very biocompatible material, but it worked radiographically. And these are some of the cases they showed. On the left, there is a molar. Um, on the top is the post-op. It's, it's not, it's not uh, clear, right? No? Okay, let's skip that. Now, another very popular study is by a group of Korea, his name is Song. And he followed these cases up to 10 years. And what he showed that the, with the use of MTA, the ABICO has a success rate of around 93%. The same group also compared cases that lesions of endodontic origin and lesions of combined perioendolesions and with cases that um, of endo region had a success of 95% compared to 77% of perioendolesion. And this is where uh, we have to work with periodontists to make this uh, work. This is one of their cases. On the, list, uh, on, the, on the left, you can see how compromised is the tooth. And on the right, a four years follow-up. Now, going back to the uh, main menu, the third option is extraction and implant. Now, implant is probably the most successful story in dental history. And that was because Brennemark uh, discovered the love relationship between titanium and bone. And it has been successful over the uh, past years. What is the indications? The indications is unrestorable teeth, non-strategic teeth, and endodontically compromised. We see a lot of dentists, when they have a problem with the endo, they just extract it because they think that they can provide a better outcome with the implants. Implants is contraindicated uh, with smokers, with patients who have a history of periodontitis, poor oral hygiene, uh, parafunctional uh, habits, um, basically occlusal trauma, cause failure to implants, or patients who, who are medically compromised, such as type 2 diabetes or type 1 uncontrolled, uh, patients who had radiotherapy, etc. Now, the process of doing implants is a lengthy procedure. It takes months, and not because we are slow, but because the bone healing is really slow. Usually, it requires a multiple surgical visits. Um, the first visit, we do the extraction, and then we wait two months if we haven't decided to an immediate placement. And then we wait for uh, another two months for the OC integration to happen, at least. And then we send it to a restorative dentist. Now, that is in the cases when there is no bone graft needed. If there is a bone graft needed, it's going to take another two to three months. So you do the calculation. So it is a lengthy procedure, and the patient will not 
be able to have a tooth at that time. And it is costly. The, the average cost of an implant is around 750 KD, including the crown. So how successful are implants? We, we had bred a lot of studies that shows that the success can be as high as 95%. There is a 98%. There are studies that show 100%. But this is one of the logical study that followed up the uh, cases up to 16 to 22 years and found that single implants have a success rate of 91%. So 9% have already failed. What about the 91%? Are they free of complications or not? One of the studies that looked at the fixed dental prosthesis found that only 66% of implants were free of complications after five years. And the majority of the problems they had is either a loose screw or um, fractured uh, uh, crown or, or peri-implantitis. And speaking of peri-implantitis, we see a lot of reports that is coming to, uh, to the papers. Um, if you have attended the AAP last uh, November in Orlando, you're going to see that a big chunk of the peri conferences is all about peri-implantitis because it became a problem. So what is peri-implantitis? There are two problems periodontally that can happen to an implant. There is the mucositis, which is basically a bleeding on probing around the implant with no bone loss, just like gingivitis. And there is a periimplantitis. And periimplantitis is inflammation of the bone around the implant. So what is the prevalence of peri-implantitis. According to the consensus of the Sixth European Workshop of Periodontology, they found that the uh, prevalence of mucositis is around 66%. That is 66% of implants have bleeding on probing. And they also said that the peri-implantitis prevalence is around 28%. Another popular study uh, by Mombelli, he wrote a paper on the epidemiology of periimplantitis, and what he said is that the periimplantitis is in the order of 10% implants and 20% patients. That means 10% implants implant problems, and 20% patient problems, risk factors. And I have to tell you that there has been reports that had as low as 1.4% that showed that the periimplantitis can happen. And there are other reports that showed as high as 60%. And there is really a big discrepancy in the literature. So that poses a fundamental question. If periimplantitis is real, what happened to the 94-98% success rate? And basically the answer is I don't know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my ear open and my eyes open. I'm going to wait for the future studies to come. And dealing with these cases I can tell you that it is a complicated clinical situation. It is a huge problem. And when you do an implant and it fails, and when you see the patient is coming to your office on your schedule, you're going to sweat. And I can tell you that dealing with uh, natural teeth is much easier than um, failed implants because it's a complicated situation. 
So what should we do about it? I think the most important thing that we should about implant is that we have to identify risk patients. And that has been the recommendation by the majority of the literature. Smokers, there is a problem with smokers. Periodontitis, big association with periimplantitis. Poor oral hygiene and part of functional habits. Now, if a patient is a broxer, the first thing that you wanted to make sure that is that they are compliant and they're going to wear their night guard. If not, then you know the implants are going to fail. Poorly controlled diabetes. And if you identify these risk factors, I think it's really important, even if you place these implants on them, you have to put them on a strict maintenance program, and that is really important. You wanted to see them every three or six months. You wanted to detect if they get any kind of periimplantitis, because the management of periimplantitis at early stages is easier, but when it gets down into uh, the bone, then there is a problem and you would have to remove the implant. We already know that after extractions, the bone shrinkage and soft tissue is unpredictable, especially with the anterior teeth. And do you know how difficult to rebuild the contour of this tooth? It's extremely difficult and it's unpredictable it's time consuming and really expensive. And these cases, especially the anterior cases, it has to be done with specialists, periodontists. These are the guys who know how to deal with these cases. I don't advise any general dentist to, to really manipulate implants into the anterior region because that is going to compromise the implants. Now, if you place implants next to natural teeth, the outcome usually is predictable. And the main reason is because the natural teeth can hold the bone and the papilla around them. And on this case, as you can see, although you can see the implants shining through the gum, but the general outcome is nice. The complication begins when you place two implants next to each other, especially in this guy who already have a periodontitis. And one, one of the biggest problems that we face is whoever placed the implant is not the guy who restored the implants, and there is a gap and miscommunications. The majority of the implants are placed without a surgical guide, and that's why prosthodontists are always complaining of surgeons, because they don't place them in the way they want it. On the other hand, the surgeons, they have no choice. They have to deal with whatever left of the bone, and that is the reality. But if you restored enough implants, you would know that using a pink porcelain is inevitable. In many cases, pink porcelain is the only way to go to restore aesthetic. Now, going back to the main menu and to compare them, I think each treatment option is a viable option. But each has, you have to understand um, what to expect from each. With epicoectomy, the success is really high, and it's done in one appointment, but the problem is we don't have enough people to do these kind of procedures. And we have to do training courses on epicoectomy. On the other hand, retreatments have the success in between 80 to 87% if you have a lesion, and it takes around two to four visits and it requires an endodontist to do the job. On the other hand, the success rate of implants is around 91 to 98%, at least for the OC integration, and we have to 
think about at the back of our head of periimplantitis. And it is a lengthy procedure. It takes a couple of months, and it requires a specialist to do the job. At the same time, you have to worry about anterior teeth where aesthetic may be compromised. Now, if you look at the lower left six, the choice is easy. The tooth is compromised and there is extensive caries. And the only option to, do, uh, to manage that case is by placing an implant. On the other hand, if you have a poorly done endodontic treatment, the only option is available is to do a retreatment. With this case, I'm going to probably do a, a retreatment for three reasons. The first reason is we have three problems with this tooth. There is a coronal leakage, as you can see from the distal part. There is also a perforation. And the problem with this root canal treatment is that it was extensively opened coronally with a very small uh, sizes apically. And that's funny because we always aim for less taper and big sizes compared to uh, this case. And these are a compromised cases where you hope for the best and you prepare for the worst. With the premolar, I think the only option that I'm going to offer the patient is an abicotomy. And the reason is because the tooth has a nice crown and a very large post. I don't think I can safely remove that post on that tooth. In this case, uh, where the complication, I mean the confusion comes, you can do an abico and you can do a retreatment. It's a nice root canal treatment. But because, as you can see from the premolars, this is a young patient, I might go for retreatment first. Now, as healthcare professionals, and we have to always, because we have a duty of care to treat uh, patients, we also have a duty of care to prevent disease. Unfortunately, we don't see that in dentistry. We see that in medicine, where the treatment options are usually for patients who have heart problems, for example, is a diet control or a, um, exercises or changing a lifestyle. These are the first uh, choice of treatments with a medical or physicians. And only if that doesn't work, they go ahead and do extensive procedures. In dentistry, we over-treat patients, and that is a fact. We usually extract natural teeth to place implants in cases uh, of teeth that can be saved. We also, as endodontists, we do a lot of extensive root canal treatments in cases that can be saved with vital pulp therapies. And by the way, there are tons of vital pulp therapies that can actually prevent uh, or maintain the vitality of the pulp. We also see a lot of restorative dentists that drill every stain they see. And that is really a problem. The point that I wanted to make is if I go back to today to my clinic and if I take bite wings of my teeth and if I find that I might need cavities, I'll be unhappy, I'll be honest with you. And if someone tells me that you're going to need a root canal treatment, I wouldn't sleep. And if someone tells me that you're going to need to extract your tooth, and this is reality, I might cry. I was just kidding. But so do patients. Patients do not like to be over-treated. They deserve to get a conservative treatment. And this is the end of my presentation today. Throwback Thursday photos.
This is my fabulous um, faculties back at the University of Pennsylvania. On the left, Dr. Kim, and in the middle is Dr. Traub, and we're privileged to have him here. And on the right is Dr. Kratchman. Uh, please comment or ask questions if you have. There is a question at the back there. Thanks, Dr. Alajmi, for this uh, excellent presentation. My name is Professor Abdullah Shamri. I am director of Riyadh Colleges of Dentistry and Pharmacy. If we go back for your main menu, and let us to debate for the audience about the last message you like each dentist here. If he or she not certified endodontist, and at the same time, he is not implantologist. I am following all of your presentation, and I have a lot of high appreciation for the way how you present. But I can see from your presentation, you shift for your background as American board certified endodontist rather than for the implants. And we ignore two important factors, the patient's need and also the patient status and the qualification of the dentist. 92 percentage of most of these cases which you showed to us, it's already came to the general dentist in their clinic, Dr. al -Ajmi. So now, if I might have deficiency in my qualification and the patient insists to have implant, for example, or I can get the message from you, be away from anterior and implant, and all complication of the epistectomy at the posterior, where now most of the implant a clinic training for general dentists encouraged to go at the posterior area to place simple implant. So what's the message I like to deliver for this audience now when they go back for their clinic, if they are general dentist? Do we have here in Kuwait, like in our country, Saudi Arabia, a good referral consultant like what we know when we train in the state? Then I must do something for the patient. That's the message which I hope you can elaborate a little bit about it. And I need to do something for my patient. We always do. <laughs> and that, really, that is a problem. Um, in, in dentistry in general, a lot of, uh, even in the States, the majority of root canals are done by general dentists. And that's why we have to deal with it. The same as implants. But the, if, you, if you can't remember, or if you decided not to remember anything from this presentation, I would like you to uh, imply or, or apply prevention in your practice. This is the message that I want everyone to, uh, to get. And of course, there are a lot of situations that implants are superior to, to root canals if the tooth is compromised. But generally speaking, prevention is the way to go, and this is how I see it. Uh, did I answer the question, or did I shift from the question? Mike, Mike. Nabi Tariq. Malikum Amr. I think so, but to certain limit, because all of us we know we cannot deal with our patient like physician. Why? Because for the last maybe 100 years, dentists always do clinical procedures, surgical procedures. But physician not. If you have a favor and you go to the physician, they try to measure your temperature, take your blood pressure, and that's it. Now, I think we need a time 
to prepare our population within our country to accept the prevention from dental office rather than the treatment. And this is really a complete changing programs. Yeah. But what's the concern now? I don't need the general dentist who's sitting now in the audience. They get lost between the option of the treatment and which item and the main menu they can select within their limitation. And there is a patient insist he or she need quick, urgent treatment according to the money in his pocket and the qualification of me. But I can see the way how we go between these three reds. It's a little bit, if I am a general dentist sitting, confusing. <laughs> but the easy way, I can go for retreatment. But you also know that endodontists, they will not accept general dentists to do a vasectomy at the posterior area. By law, I don't know about this system in Kuwait, I know in Saudi Arabia, if somebody do a vasectomy, general dentist in the posterior area, and the patient complain, this is a big crime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's not even easy for endodontist. It's a very difficult surgical procedure. And I don't think um, anyone can do it, especially lower molars, without a microscope. So they have to understand that these cases, complicated cases, have to be referred to specialists to do the job for them, even for the implants. For the sake of time, we don't want to take much of Dr. Trope's time, so we'll take one more question. Uh, thank you for uh, informative lecture. My name is Wasmi Al Hayyan. I am a master student in pediatric dentistry at Riyadh College. Uh, we know in literature there is a lack of evidence regarding the failure and the successful that have reported by Stephen in 2004. My question, uh, I read an article for Friedman in 1999 that there is a perforation regarding the abyxectomy. Uh, and you show there is a high successful rate. My question, does there is other complication associated with abyxectomy uh, as a treatment? Complications? Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, if you do a lower molar uh, abico, there is probably a slight uh, risk of uh, paresthesia. These are the complications that... Other complications might be a uh, communication with the upper, a, um, the, with the maxillary sinus, uh, and usually we manage this by placing a cotton sutured and pull it back to block the um, sinus from the inside. Um, complications can be uh, bleeding. Bleeding is really a huge problem because the osteotomy is only three millimeter. And you can imagine that in just one second, one drop of, of blood is going to block it. And that's why we use the AP bracelets or other measures. Um, the other complications that might be is a root fracture. It, sometimes when we open a tooth and, and during the surgery, we, when we stain it, we found that there is a vertical fracture. And we usually do the extraction at the same time. These are the, what I can remember, the, the, the majority of the complications that uh, occurred to me.